Illegal wildlife trafficking is the third largest illegal trade in the world. It's a system that, by some estimates, nets more than $20 billion a year. That's more than the illegal weapons trade. And that's also where a sort of CSI for animals steps in. The book Animal Investigators goes inside the world's first wildlife forensics lab and looks at the difficulty of solving these types of crimes. Dr. Laurel Nimi is the book's author. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. So what is the outcome of this traffic? What is it used for? People are buying ivory for jewelry, right? Or skins for handbags? Correct. And it's really the new bling. Uh, people have more wealth and they want to flaunt it and they want something rarer and more exotic. And so they often go for the most um, endangered species made into various products. And this is happening right here in the U.S.? In fact, the U.S. is the second largest consumer mm -hmm. of these illegal wildlife products after China. And some of these products are very exotic, so to speak, right? Black bear bladders, for example. Can you explain that one? That's one of the things you look at in your book. Correct. And bear bile is used for traditional Chinese medicine. It's used as treatment for liver diseases and gallstones, and it's worth about $40,000 a kilo, It has a, which is more than uh, cocaine at 30000 and other products are worth even more, 50000 a kilo for rhino horn. Okay, so what is the government doing to stop this trade? Well, the government is doing several things. They run undercover investigations and they have inspectors at ports. Mm -hmm. But a key part of that is to prosecute these cases, they really need to be able to prove that a crime occurred. And to do that, they have to prove that the product that's trafficked is, in fact, from a protected species. So we say this is sort of a CSI crime lab, the first of its kind, right? Correct. And it, where is it, in Oregon? It's in Ashland, Oregon. Okay, and so what actually happens there? How uh, detailed do these investigations get? Well, it's similar to human forensics in that um, it's used to answer a legal question. And it's also uh, similar in that it links a crime to a suspect and a victim. Where it's different is that instead of one species of victim, it has 30,000 species to deal with. Okay, and uh, can you tell me about one of the more interesting cases you cover in the book? And so often um, in a human forensics lab, mm -hmm. the victim arrives as a body in the lab, but here the evidence arrives in a, uh, as a powdered medicine or a, um, you know, ivory pendant, and it's impossible to tell from the naked eye what species it is. So one of the cases I follow is uh, bear gallbladder trafficking, mm -hmm. and in that case, uh, undercover investigators purchased or, and sold gallbladders, uh, and the lab had to prove that it was from bear. Were you yourself surprised how uh, detailed these investigations get and the lengths they go to to solve these crimes? I was because many of these undercover investigations run two, three years mm -hmm. in the making and the outcome is even if the prosecution succeeds, often the penalties are extremely low. And what kind of uh, penalties are we talking about if you do get caught? If you do get caught, typically it's a uh, slap on the wrist or forfeit of the products. Uh, sometimes there's some jail time. The maximum penalty is five years and $250,000 under the Federal Lacey Act. So is there a move right now to increase the penalties to discourage people from doing this? Um, it's really one of the reasons I wrote this book is to create awareness and possibly lead to public uh, wanting these penalties increase. Okay, and what can we do in the public to help out? You can do things like not buy these products, right? Correct. There are really three things uh, that the average person can do. One is to not buy these exotic animal products, and the second mm -hmm. is to not buy exotic animal pets. And the third is to talk uh, you know, talk to your congressman or state representative and advocate for wildlife law enforcement. And sometimes it's hard to tell whether these products are legal or illegal, right? So how do you know as a consumer when you go to buy a belt or a handbag whether it's made out of an illegal uh, exotic animal? Well, often you don't. You can't tell with the naked eye. And in fact, criminals know this and they use that uh, as an excuse. Um, when caught, they say, oh, it's not really an illegal product. And that's where the lab steps in. So it's very difficult to know. But if it's expensive and it's advertised as rare, then there's a good possibility that it might be illegal. So the best thing to do, ask a lot of questions and read the book. Correct. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank Dr. You. Laurel Nimi, author of Animal Investigators, thank you so much for joining us. Thank Thank you for having me.
Well, you don't have to be a forensics expert to figure out what happened to this puppy. This tiny week old dog survived after being accidentally flushed down a toilet and getting trapped in a pipe. Plumbers use special cameras you see here to nudge him towards a manhole cover where they were able to yank him out. And soon the mystery of how the puppy got stuck was solved. You put him in the toilet, didn't you? So what did you why did you do that? Did you put him in the toilet because he was muddy? Yeah. Well, little Danny Blair did apologize for stuffing his dog in the toilet and promised not to do it again. The puppy has been renamed Dino in honor of his rescuers. This is CBS News, up to the minute.